Hi, I'm Sam Hawley, coming to you from the lands of the Gadigal people. This is ABC News Daily. While energy giants have made massive excess profits this year worth billions of dollars, consumers are facing soaring power bills. But it's going to get worse, with predictions costs will have increased by 50% by the end of next year. Today, the ABC's energy reporter, Dan Mercer, on the government's plan to intervene in the market to ease the pain. Dan, my last gas bill was a little scary. It was a lot more than I'm used to. It's not good news. No, no, there's very little good news from a consumer point of view. Just how long Australians will have to wait for cheaper power bills, as Labor promised at the election, proving much more difficult to measure. calls from politicians across the spectrum, from the Greens to even the Liberal Party, for the government to intervene. Um, You know, we've obviously seen some pretty massive price rises in the wholesale market, you know, so much so that the market operator this year actually had to step in Mm. to suspend trading because things simply got out of hand. And, um, you know, the federal government in its October budget tipped gas bills to rise by 40% over the next two years, at least on the East Coast. Budget forecast electricity prices could soar 56% in 18 months, with gas bills to rise 44% in the same period. The opposition... Uh, And, you know, just to take an example, an average household gas bill in New South Wales in January was $186. Um, And that'll jump to almost $300 next year. And of course, you know, households in Victoria, for example, you know, they typically use much more gas than households in New South Wales. So their bills will jump higher still. Mm, A lot of money that can't go elsewhere, you know, that you're going to have to redirect into your gas bills. It's not a very pleasant thought. The war in Ukraine, it's a big factor, isn't it? Yeah, massive. It's a massive factor. Mm. I mean, you know, the thing is, gas markets were already tight uh, at the beginning of this year and the end of last year. Uh, because of elevated demand in Europe and North Asia as economies sort of roared back um, post-COVID. Uh, and, you know, and also, it has to be said, because Vladimir Putin had been throttling supplies into Europe mm. ahead of his invasion of Ukraine. But the invasion itself just sent the market into orbit. A European Union embargo on Russian oil exports by sea is coming into force. The West is hoping to squeeze... Moscow's you know, all of a sudden, one of the world's Ukraine. biggest natural gas producers in Russia was blacklisted from Western markets. And that just meant, you know, you had the same amount of Western demand chasing fewer supplies, Mm. Uh, you know, in courtesy of our exposure to those international markets through those big gas plants in Queensland in particular. uh, The East Coast has imported those prices here. Mm, Okay, but Dan, we've got masses of gas here. So why aren't we immune even a little bit from these soaring costs? Yeah, yeah, (laughs) the perennial question these days. I mean, on the face of it, you'd be right to think Australia has a lot of gas, Mm. along with Qatar and the United States. We are the biggest exporters in the world of what's known as liquefied natural gas, uh, which is basically gas that's super chilled so it can be loaded onto ships and, Mm. you know, exported that way. But the reality is that most of Australia's gas... Uh, is exported via the LNG trade. It's about 70%, certainly it was in 2021. Uh, And much of that gas is sold via long-term contracts with big buyers in places like Japan, South Korea and China. And, you know, what's become so contentious is the question of surplus supplies, both in terms of how much is offered to the domestic market and, crucially, at what price. You'll hear from buyers that even if they're offered gas these days, the prices, you know, being asked are just unbearably high. And, um, you know, that's obviously got some pretty big implications for those users who are often manufacturers and industrial customers who must have the gas. And households are also affected too. Mm. Not everyone's copying it though in WA, uh, where I happen to live, 
it's a very different story. Mm, so you're, okay, <laughs> this is, uh, doesn't seem fair. So your gas bills aren't going up like my gas bills are. So just explain why that is. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> the gas prices are going up a little bit in Western Australia, mm-hmm. but it's, it's you know, it's almost um, infinitesimal compared with what's happening on the East Coast. Mm. On the East Coast, these sky-high prices are actually a relatively recent phenomenon. If you go back to the genesis of, you know, the modern East Coast gas industry, it really started when discoveries were made in the Bass Strait in the 1960s Mm. by the big Australian BHP, and I think it was Esso. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that provided a supply of cheap, abundant gas, and that in turn underpinned a massive expansion in manufacturing, particularly in Victoria. You know, so for about 50 years, Australian gas prices were stable and low, and, and there was also state ownership of many of the assets, which just helped to further keep a lid on things. That all started to change in the 1990s with, you know, privatisation agendas, and the, the shift was supercharged, really, by the East Coast moving towards export gas. Mm-hmm. And that sort of was a process that began in earnest in the 2000s, um, and the gas started being exported about seven years ago. That just changed everything. Mm, I gather they thought that exporting was going to make them more money. Well, yeah. I mean, it, 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 was, a, it was a business case. Um, yeah. you know, certainly oil producers saw a big arbitrage opportunity you know, to buy uh, and produce gas cheaply in Australia and sell it into international markets where the prices you know, are often much higher. You know, they made some big assumptions as well around the abundance of gas resources in eastern Australia and crucially the ease of accessing those resources. Um, you know, that's proven to be a, a pretty lucrative course of action in recent times, it has to be said, but there are obviously domestic consequences for that. Mm. Very good. Well, good afternoon. I'm here with the uh, Treasurer and the Minister for Energy. Now, this uh, was to a large extent foreseeable Uh, and there were calls for a domestic gas reservation policy. Uh, The government has received and released two important reports on the state of the gas market in eastern Australia from the Australian Energy Market Operator. That never happened on the east coast, but it did in WA. Mm -hmm. And, you know, over here, state policy is that 15% of a gas field's reserves have to be set aside for the local market. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it's definitely the biggest reason why our prices have stayed so much lower and more stable than the East Coast. Mm, Okay. well, Dan, when he brought down his first budget, the Treasurer, Jim Chalmers, he did promise that he would do something to help Australians on the East Coast, I suppose, with these soaring energy prices. And the government, we know, is considering a cap on coal and a cap on gas. So let's just stick with gas, which is what we've been talking about. What's it proposing to do in that area? Look, I probably will just say from the outset, Sam, that the government hasn't really said for sure what it's going to do. Mm -hmm. But the speculation is that it'll impose a cap on wholesale gas prices. Is Cabinet seriously considering a price cap on gas and coal? Cabinet is considering a wide range of options to deal with what we regard as a very serious national... And it's the wholesale market that's the real problem uh, at the moment, it seems. You know, longer-term contracts are often set using that as a marker and prices there have been going berserk in 2022. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a meeting of state and federal energy ministers due to take place and the plan certainly was for the Prime Minister and Premiers to thrash out a deal later in the week. Mm -hmm. That's under a cloud given Anthony Albanese's got COVID, you know, but we'll see. In any case, it seems the government is keen on a wholesale price cap for gas. And, you know, the way it'll work is producers will simply be unable to offer buyers gas at a price higher than $12 a gigajoule when they put a term sheet in front of them, which is basically where the rubber hits the road. Mm. You know, $12 is still a darn sight better than the average spot price this year of more than $40 a gigajoule. Mm, and we're all cheering for that, I think. So the energy giants won't be, though, I assume. Look, a big complaint you hear again and again in these circumstances is sovereign risk. Mm-hmm. And that basically means the risks to investors of governments retrospectively changing the rules and doing something that makes their investments, their bets, less attractive. You know, they claim one of Australia's great advantages is its 
lack of sovereign risk uh, and talk of price caps and other interventions sort of undermines that. The other thing they're worried about is, you know, how any intervention might affect their ability to deliver agreed supplies, you know, with long-term buyers. But I think the example of Western Australia, Sam, you know, shows that warnings of investment flight, capital flight, they call it, uh, as a result of these sorts of measures can often be exaggerated in Australia. There have been a suite of gigantic LNG projects that have gone to market, um, even accounting for that. A, a, a really interesting kind of element to all of this is the potential for unintended consequences. For example, big fertiliser companies are massive users of gas, and obviously they're having to pay much higher prices for that gas in Australia. But they have an out clause because they can charge high prices for the ammonia, for the fertiliser that they produce at the other end. If they essentially get the advantage of cheaper capped wholesale price Australian gas as a result of this government intervention, but they're not subject to any sort of price cap at the other end when they sell their product, um, that basically just means that the profits are being transferred from oil and gas companies to the fertiliser manufacturers in this case. And of course, fertiliser feeds directly into our food supplies. All right, Dan. So the big question is, if it goes ahead and this cap is put in place, will it reduce our bills? Well, look, you'd have to think so. The $12 a gigajoule will basically just take the sting out of the market. Mm. It'll eliminate the volatility. And so now the government basically setting the price at $12 a gigajoule or no more than, everyone will probably just coalesce around that price. I think that's probably what's likely to happen. They won't offer less than $12 a gigajoule in all likelihood, and they can't offer any more. You know, for most buyers of gas and most users of gas, paying $12 a gigajoule would represent, you know, a much lower cost. Dan Mercer is the ABC's energy reporter based in WA. National Cabinet is scheduled to reconvene virtually on Friday to consider the plan to tackle soaring energy prices. It's thought any measures taken won't have an impact on energy bills until midway through next year. This episode was produced by Flint Duxfield and Chris Dengate, who also did the mix. Our supervising producer this week is Sydney Pete. I'm Sam Hawley. ABC News Daily will be back again tomorrow. Thanks for listening. Subscribe to listen to more free podcasts or download the ABC Listen app and stream ad-free. 